Welcome to Let's Think About It. I'm Ryder Richards, and joining me is Mr. Lisa. Today, we are covering William James' pragmatism. And we're kind of just letting the conversation roam wherever it will. Now, we're both artists who met in West Texas about a dozen years ago. Elle is one of those great people who reads a lot of books and has a much better handle on philosophy than I do. Now, I bumped into her in 2019 on this trip out to Boston, and we've been chatting ever since about ideas and art and just whatever. So for the podcast, this interview style, well, this is a first for me. But I'm going to try to bring on a guest every month or so, maybe liven it up a bit, and start having a little reading group as well with other people to help us talk through the things that we read. If you'd like to join us, go to the website at letusthinkaboutit.com, where a one-time donation or monthly support, which really helps us fund this shindig, it can get you access to the community we're trying to build. Now, if you want to join but can't afford it, just let me know. Send me an email or something, and I'll find a way to get you subscribed. All right, on with the show. All right, this is Ryder Richards with Let Us Think About It. Uh, I have a guest with me today. Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm Mr. Lisa. You can call me L. <laughs> um, okay, so we are recording, and we're going to be talking today about uh, William James and pragmatism. I think I started reading the books at the very beginning of the year, so I read them in the first couple weeks of January. So I'm going to be relying mostly on L to <laughs> figure this out for me. <laughs> oh no. Okay. I'm. I. I. I I've been. I'm. I read I'm I'm read them and then I read them I'm reading them again and cuz I have ADHD and I've had several concussions and find that rereading helps me um uh, but yeah I also like uh yeah okay cool sorry <laughs> okay so like what is your process then like if you're going to read them do you underline do you take notes like things like that uh, b- both and um, I also like have the audiobook uh, now when I really need to pay attention and focus uh, so I can like force myself to read along. Um, but I frequently have to pause the audiobook because I get excited and I have to like look up a bunch of other stuff that I'm like, oh, ideas and thoughts about the thing that was just said or read or whatever. And yeah, so it's, it can be slow going. I, I don't know. I find it good to read things slowly and ponder them and sometimes go down the rabbit holes. I think it can add to the reading and make it more relevant. Yes, but I, this very much gave me my, uh, like, uh, like I was back in uh, school vibes and like, I was like, oh no, I'm like not doing my homework enough. enough. <laughs> yeah, during a <laughs> pandemic, writer puts stress on you. That's what I do. <laughs> Um, I found reading them and I hadn't read them in maybe 10 years. And so picking these up and going through them and what I had read previously was just a a short essay and is a moral equivalent of war. And basically in there, he just talks about the romance of violence. And instead of going to war, then we could be doing things like putting people into similar kind of group situations, but they'd be taking care of parks or helping out infrastructure Mm. or helping other people. And there didn't have to be this kind of, uh, romance of violence or could actually just be engagement with nature as a replacement Uh so i don't know when i read him i'm always kind of blown away by his ability to put out a turn of phrase but also kind of feel like the speech is common speech like i feel like i can understand what he's talking about yeah he he has a very like sort of like a plain way of speaking in some ways but he definitely sounds like a person that lived in 1907 um uh, also is there some some of the ways that he like talks I'm like okay yeah I feel like I am I'm definitely felt like I'm was back at university like I was okay yeah okay 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 guy all right um but uh yeah no I my like renewed interest came from reading this book empathy this is like we started talking about some of the stuff in this book and how empathy's origins uh, are in German 
Einfühlung, and which means in in feeling, and the artist Vernon Lee and thinker Vernon Lee um, was friends with William James's brother Henry, and they like got to talking, and she was very excited about his psychology, which, who, okay, that's a whole other thing about William James. We gotta. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a real rough rough breakdown of his life, I guess. He was born in 1842, so I did jot down some notes here. Um, okay. So he has a brother named Henry and a sister, Alice, both of them like super accomplished as well. And in 1866 through 72, he was basically suffering from depression during this time period. In 1890, he comes up with Principles of Psychology, which is like 1,200 pages. And he does this when he's- Two 40, volumes. Two yeah. volumes, right. And he does this when he's age 48. So that still gives us time. We can still do oh, something. Oh, yeah. yeah. right. Nice. Okay. Um, and then in 1907, he has pragmatism, and 1909 is pluralistic universe, and then in 1910, he dies of heart failure. Mm. So he kind of um, he kind of kicked it in the last 20 years of his life and really did a whole yeah. lot of stuff and became a kind of popular intellectual and thinker. Right. And then, like, he had other writings, too, um, like uh, – like a varieties the varieties of religious experience yeah. was another mm-hmm. one of his and um yeah he was an interesting fellow very like uh in some ways i would say he seems to be very like postmodern in his thinking um compared to ooh, lots of people of this time um and like and especially like when you think of like what is postmodernism, you don't really think about it starting at the beginning of the 20th century you sort of think of like the 20th century as being like high modernism and stuff and um but i think because of his interest in like the pluralism um that put puts him more into postmodernism <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're both drinking bubbly water, so you're going to get some burps <laughs> during the episode. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think that I was bumping into the same thing of thinking this guy was writing about this stuff in the early 1900s and a lot of, and you know, and before, and it seemed very prevalent. Like you could see how he was talking about issues of transparency and group consensus and people having individual truths and things like that that are far outside of what was coming previously where everyone was going for these universal truths. There was like one Mm -hmm. absolute truth that they had to find and it existed in this alternate realm. And he really seemed to be sick of that. Objective T truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, like the idea of uh, like, I think James, James came up with some really good ideas and um, did we talk about what pragmatism like how it's a praxis. Oh no, go for, no. go on with that. That's good. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but uh, yeah. So like with the um, pragmatism, to me, it seems to me that he's sort of arguing for pragmatism to be a methodology that sort of helps you sort out this false binary that's presented w- between the like soft mindedness and tough mindedness. Yeah, I think it's them. tender and tough. Tender-minded. Mm-hmm. Tender. Yeah. yeah, soft-minded sounds a little like, oh, he's touched <laughs> in know, the edge. Right. <laughs> uh, dropped one too many times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, tender-minded, excuse me, um, and tough-minded. And sort of like uh, he po- talks about like how no one like strictly falls under either ca- category and how that can kind of like sort of re- um, create this cognitive dissonance. He doesn't come out and say cognitive dissonance, but what he's describing is cognitive dissonance. Um, and with like how we all hold contradictory beliefs. And so he's saying that like pragmatism is a way of thinking that helps you sort of figure out what is true for you and what is not true for you and what works best for you. And what works best for you is truth. And so that is really beautiful. And the way that um, 
pragmatism has been boiled down is less so. It's sort of like whatever works is true. Um, Which is more like a kind of utilitarianism. And mm-hmm. uh, I, but it, yeah, I think that tough minded, tender minded, this kind of idea that, that he references the empiricists, people that are only fact based as being these really mm-hmm. tough minded people. And then he sort of talks about these other kind of more idealistic people as being the tender minded ones. And I, I thought that was kind of interesting that, uh, you know, I think of myself probably as being tender minded, but I love the idea that I could also look at facts and have an objective reality uh-huh. and an objective truth. And, you know, that's an interesting thing because I can always fight for my own individual truths, but I want to know what the actual truth is so I can make sure I'm going in the right direction. So it's like an, a, a, you, you want to understand like an objective truth because you still feel like object, you're still holding objective truth higher than relative truth. And it's just because, um, you know, I think there's a potential to see that relative truths can also lead to relative ends where people are treated relatively. And so I don't want that to be an outcome, right? So well, we already have that. We do. Um, um, we already have that like relative inness, and I would say that um, like there there is like a fault in pragmatism um, if you do not include the pluralism of it, because if you ignore the pluralistic side of it, then it turns into this incredibly individualistic um, philosophy that is very compatible with capitalism. Mm -hmm. Um, If you have it, if you include the pluralism, though, it is less compatible with capitalism. Because if your pragmatism is an ethic, then um, you are... And it's something that recognizes like this interconnected nature and this pluralistic, um, interdependent nature. Then you aren't going to be able to be a good capitalist and ethical at the same mm. time. That's a really good point. I bumped into something the other day that was talking about facts and capitalism and power lying in certain areas and how truth can come from the like when you're looking at things that are facts or only consensus based so if you look at the population for instance and they all believe one thing then that's kind of consensus truth but Mm -hmm. there can also be facts that are outside of it that are a different kind of truth and then there's individual subjective truths that people have as well um but it was talking about how consensus truth and fact-based truth oftentimes are handed down from this kind of like it feels like a very powerful force it's like the hegemony already has that the superstructure is pushing it down on you and so it can seem very forceful and strong and powerful so the idea would be like how do you combat those forceful things that are being pushed on you these sort of it looks like they're objective truths because consensus is in how much effort is given to them. I think James has a really great quote about if you repeat anything often enough, then it becomes the truth. And so there's this kind of idea that you just go, well, no, that's not true. So in an interesting way, he's pushing back against these kind of massive truths and saying that there's still something about it, a person or an individual that has you know, a subjective experience, but that there needs to be room for that within your worldview. At least that's a mm-hmm. feeling I get from uh, reading pragmatism. Yeah, so the way that I sort of like um, saw it, it's it's it reminded me a lot. Um, parts of it reminded me a lot of um, the Paulo Freire book that I read recently, um, the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and in it he talks about like how it is only through recognizing our limited perspective and acknowledging the subjective truths of many that we are able to sort of like take those subjective truths and combine them together to create an objective truth. And um, I I was really, like, relieved when I read that and also, like, when I was reading James because I was like, man, I feel so crazy because I remember, like, saying that in my, like, philosophy club reading group or whatever that I was in when I was an undergrad. And, like, by the two professors that ran it, they were like, really you've always like that's how you thought objective truth worked they were like fascinated and yeah and, and so i was like huh yeah, what? yeah. <laughs> and so it like people are like in america often there's this like weird 
need to feel like super unique, you know, like, oh, I'm like such an original thinker. It made me feel crazy all the time. Like, so whenever I find someone that like, that has lived long before me, (laughs) that had ideas similar, I get excited because no one wants to be alone. No, no, we don't. We don't. I, and I think that this is, that people like to think of themselves a certain way. And a lot of who we are is reflected back on us by how other people see us and interact with us, right? And we're social creatures. So therefore we always have hierarchies in terms of, you know, systems of dominance and social situations and all this kind of stuff. And we're always sort of jockeying and playing. And this all just comes back to being tribal creatures and growing out of, you know, uh, social kind of, mirroring that we end up sort of taking on truths or common sense and other kind of things as ways to navigate the world. And James does talk about some of that, how these truths come to us and then we, they become essentially fixed within us. And then Mm -hmm. for them to change, then we usually, it takes a lot of effort and we don't want to do it, but sometimes a new truth can be grafted onto our old set of truths, but these truths are contradictory. And I think that that's something that's also kind of brilliant that he brings up that humans have this capacity to hold contradictory truths. And so this idea of having one singular truth that somehow has to encompass all things seems kind of like an impossibility. And while it might happen Mm. eventually, we're not at a stage where we have enough knowledge to get there yet. So maybe we just should quit playing with that idea. Yeah. And it's funny because like uh, uh, science, for example, is like also obsessed with a sort of like grand unifying theory and we are closer to understanding it, but we are not, like, 100% there yet. And But some of the stuff that he says, I'm, like, I got, like, really excited. I'm, like, oh, you, like, where, where you, in pragmatism, he's, like, on one in the mini is, like, loosely speaking and in general, it may be said that all things cohere and adhere to each other somehow, and that the universe exists practically in reticulated or concentrated forms which make of it continuous or integrated affair and i was like electrons bitch like (laughs) that's electrons i was like electrons basically it it makes everything like cohere and adhere to each other like we you know space as we understand it and empty space especially is an illusion like there is no such thing as um empty space so to speak unless that's what dark matter is but we don't know what dark matter is and there's like another thing dark energy um Mm. maybe dark energy is nothing maybe like actual physical nothing like the uh the uh the never ending story like that's what i think (laughs) of when i hear dark energy that dark energy is the nothing um (laughs) I don't think that's what dark energy actually is, by the way. uh. No, but dark energy is another one of these things that shows up like the ether or something, right? Where all of a sudden, like we go through these periods in science where everyone believes in this thing. Then they find out, oh, wait, that never existed. We just had bad math at the time or something. (laughs) And you just go, oh. And so this is the other problem with like wholeheartedly giving yourself to some sort of scientific truth Mm -hmm. is that those truths are also shifting, right? And so... I think, well, something that science has taught us, one, like superposition, that things are both and, um, Mm -hmm. excuse me, and (laughs) uh, that what we understand as stability, like our, our understanding of stability, when I think of like stability abstractly, I'm thinking of like something that's solid and static most of the time, right? Like, is what do you, what do you think of? What do you think of stability? Yeah, no, that's uh, that makes sense to me. I don't know. I, I usually don't apply it to actual objects. <laughs> but that's not that's not what how stability is. Stability is not a static thing. Stability is a dynamic thing, mm. and like we understand that now because of uh, like the ever expanding universe or whatever. But you know, we we didn't know that in James's time. We didn't know, like, we uh, we think we talked about this briefly. Like, electrons were discovered in his lifetime, and uh, in eighteen ninety seven, 
and um, Einstein's special relativity was published in 1905, which is where he talks about light being also a particle um, and a wave um, and space time and special relativity. Like we didn't fucking understand that shit till recently, sort of, maybe, I don't know. There's a lot, yeah. been a lot of stuff come out about gravity recently, but I have to like, I, who knows what, what yeah, and I'm not entirely now. up on all of it. I what I neither am I. The, yeah, <laughs> no, I mean I'm not really at all. But what I do sort of realize about this are these changing truths. And at one point, I think James has an entire example he brings up of looking at a, a is it either a chair or a desk? In one of his lectures, he talks about a chair or a desk and how we could analyze it and break it down that continuously. That's a desk because Hegel all had the table. Okay. It was he was in the middle of a lecture and he kind of goes off for about a paragraph or two on this desk and, and basically saying we could pick this apart and we could say how do you know it's a desk and do you know this and, and how does it but then in the end he goes but does it work in reality and how do you use it and how does it function and this becomes I think like a hallmark of pragmatism is that yes we can get down into the you know molecular thing or we can get into how we recognize the world and the, rec the world recognizes us and that gets into like Kant and how we use you know different kinds of filters to see the world and if there is an objective truth outside of us or if everything is internalized and then it becomes intersubjective because we all agree on it you know and mm -hmm. you start getting into these strange things but I think at one point he just is kind of like if we can get past arguing about that then maybe we can actually just agree on something more useful and move forward. Yeah, I, I, I find thinking about things a priori, which is like a Kant thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Prior I knowledge. Think it, I think it is, um, uh, if nothing is truly a priori, like there is a priori within the existence of human knowledge in that, like, knowledge that, uh, like, people before me had knowledge. Like, William James, James's knowledge existed before me. But nothing exists outside of its context. Like, we are every context, we are contextual beings. Like, we, like, uh, is there an a priori to the consciousness of the Big Bang? Does the Big Bang have consciousness? I don't know. I don't think that that's very useful. And there is like a point where he talks about the consciousness of God, and I, um, which I thought thought was interesting. I hadn't really thought about the consciousness of God yeah. in a hot second. Um, <laughs> and frankly, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that something too? Let's hop on that for a minute because when I'm reading this stuff and I get into these sections about how all these philosophers are dealing with God and I'm just like, you're spending so much brain energy on this. Like you're like, and I think I, I talked about that with Hegel, right? Is that you bring up this idea of the negation of the other in order to get through this. And I'm just sitting there going like, and James brings them up too. And these guys are talking about how amazingly complicated things have to be in order to make room for God. And I wonder if this is just a social pressure that they feel they have to follow or if this is actually sort of an internal thing for people to always leave sort of um, the wiggle room so that we don't have to deal with uh, sort of issues of fate that feel like we somehow can determine our own fate. Um, I'm just always curious about whether a good philosophy like leaves room for those kind of human impulses. Uh I would say a lot of philosophy that I've read has been more about like how to tame human impulses and like, um, cause it's very much been like influenced by Augustine, um, because tons of like the Western canon is just theology in, uh, in some ways, especially like once Christianity is introduced. Um, I mean, Descartes, like, his whole fucking thing, like, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, so you have, shit, I forgot what I was, uh, oh, the, so they're all, like, trying to figure out and wrestle with God, and, but the, so many of them have accepted 
like Augustine's idea of like original sin. That's the thing is like so many of these people they they a- ask you to like question so much and when you look at it I like reading it now when I was an undergrad I couldn't always see like where people stop questioning reading reading it now though I'm like oh you're so close you like you're like so close to getting it like when he's he's talking about like are we one or are we many like how how could it be both and like one of the things that we know about now like uh, on top of superposition like if you want to get into like a more less abstract thing you have like how mushrooms exist mycelium and rhizomes and um and so it's all actually like one giant um organism or network organism thank you Mm -hmm. thank you and and like like the fruiting bodies is like what we see and we think of them as individuals but they're not actually individuals and i sort of like had this thought the other day i was like oh we're sort of like the mushrooms were like the fruiting body of the mycelium of existence. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. Yeah. Well, and I was, it's funny you make, bring this up because of course I listened to a podcast on mushrooms the other day. And oh really? Yeah. Yeah. It was all about. While you took mushrooms or. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> How else do you do it? Um, oh. No, there was this whole thing where it was, uh, it was really about the interconnectedness and how they feed trees and so there's this weird thing that they do where they store and pass on um, different kinds of nutrients from tree to tree. So if yeah. a certain kind of tree is starving of a certain nutrient, but say an oak tree has it, then it can pull that and pass it to this other tree. So they're actually all helping each other. And then it gets into modern agriculture and how we're breaking apart the soil, which breaks apart the ability to pass this stuff back and forth. And industrialization has led to all these things. And there's really intelligence built into it, but we didn't understand the intelligence. So we sort of just co-opted the world as a producer rather than co-opting it as this thing that was a giver. And it really changes. uh... One of the things that I think about um, the most, one of the most damaging things I think humans have like come to believe especially like if you've read like the bible or genesis or whatever if you like interpret the genesis story as something that you're supposed to have dominion over and like there is a shitload of evidence that that is how at least America, or the United States, has has interpreted that, and pragmatically, mm. that's fucked up. We <laughs> fucked yeah, shit yeah. up. We really fucked shit up, like globally. <laughs> yeah. So is this the is this the danger of pragmatism because it's so closely aligned with practical that we feel like we have practical truths and we move forward based off of usefulness. So that's the difficulty. So you have like, okay, so uh, if it is a methodology of praxis or whatever, then you have your larger frameworks, your larger isms or whatever. Um, And I would argue in this case, like society, like and how society is structured is a larger ism, so to speak. So capitalism is... um, like the way it functions in capitalism and like asking that question of like oh the practicality or like the whatever works you've like pragmatism often fails to ask well who does it work for like in because it it doesn't work for everybody you know, capitalism doesn't work for everybody. Capitalism doesn't work for the global South. Capitalism does not work for the majority of people in the United States. I mean, like, look at this past year. Like that. <sighs> yeah, but no, I mean, these are the these are the interesting things is um, because I, I, there's a lot of these things he has about truth, right? Like verifying uh-huh. it and. And when I start thinking about these big isms, there's also these big truths. And when you get into something like a capitalism, there's a lot of energy and power behind it, right? And and the mm-hmm. idea that it is somehow because quality of life for a lot of people, I think if you look at charts, it looks like it has increased. You can it has, yes. Like o- overall, like in some ways, like yes, there is less violence in the world than previously. In general, there is less disease than 
previously. And who knows what this year has done to that statistic. Um, but in general, like, it appears that, yes, we are doing better, but we also are sort of at, like, a point in existence where I feel like we're sort of, like, at a tipping point. We're, like, at a precipice where it's going to break. Like, we're already pretty broken, but it's sort of like if you break a piece of wood, like, you know, it's, like, cracked, but it's not, like, completely broken yet. We're sort of, like, a cracked piece of wood, and Which, at this point, it loses its integrity, right? So the yeah. stick no longer has its sort of structural integrity, and it takes just, mm -hmm. what, a little more pressure, one or two yeah. more things to happen, and then collapse. And yeah. I think there's... There's something to that in that, uh, I don't know, I would assume that ideas have a shelf life, and as society moves along, it, you know, sort of does the chains of equivalence thing, or it sort of joins up lots of different ideas to sort of survive along the way, and then we get to a point where we've maxed out all the survival situations, and the thing is, it's, uh, I was reading Baudrillard the other day, and it was just talking about how everything is appearance and superficiality, so the systems are all running on their own for their own sake, and it's lost the idea that originally carried it. So, mm. you know, if we're... It's purpose. Right, if we the were going like, for a utopia, well, it's somewhere along the way we're just chasing down progress. We're just deconstructing things to deconstruct them. We're not doing it for any end result. We're just letting mm -hmm. the processes run themselves. And we're actually mistaking the processes for uh, the thing or we're mistaking mm -hmm. them for progress while yes. they might actually just be harming us and it's yeah. because we've sort of lost touch with those larger, greater ideals. Yeah. Uh, so, like, we we had all of these advances um, under capitalism as, as, like, humans for a lot of things, but at huge cost to our ability to live symbiotically with the Earth. Like, massive cost. And this is, like, something that... Because I, I sort of... I think that, like, the idea of capitalism and the, like, a marketplace of ideas and, like, whatever idea were, wins, like, is the best or whatever. Like, the, the markets are not necessarily the problem. The idea of capitalism, I feel like, is inherently exploitative and hierarchical. And, like, anything that is hierarchical is going to be oppressive to someone. And so you need a non-hierarchical structure to... to have equality and you can do that it, but i don't know how <laughs> yeah, it, it can't right. exist no i don't fully know how well There's and no I've, way that we can yeah yeah this is of course i think 30 minutes <laughs> right right but this is solve the world let's problems just do this mm -hmm. well it's one of the reasons i think that i do something like start this podcast and work on these shows and then want to engage in these kind of conversations is you know, sharing ideas. Uh, so part of what I feel like I've been doing in the podcast so far is just diagramming out some concerns and problems and breaking apart appearances and saying, this looks this way, but maybe it's not this way. And mm -hmm. maybe this doesn't function this way anymore. And then there's also sort of the mental health aspect, right? So there's the way society works. There's our own mentalities that go on. In some ways to sort of like find meaningful ways to sort of repair those so that then when we do move forward, maybe we don't desire the same things. Maybe we don't desire mm -hmm. the traps that we've been shown. And and those are, that, that's uh, at least something I'm trying to work with right now. Like, I think that's true. I think that like our desire can change, but it's really hard mm -hmm. to let go of it. Because like, I, you know, just imagine like go, gr growing up, like being super hardcore believer and then like, studying it and being like oh this god that i was raised to believe in did does not exist in this form and like just having your entire like it it's hard and there were many times when i like i still went to church for years after stopping believing in god because i wanted that community and there was like a part of me that wanted to believe in in that I finally stopped wanting to believe in it because I finally was able to examine it 
in in a like get distance from it. It's hard. It is hard though, but you have to have time to reflect mm-hmm. to be able to change your world view and yeah. Yeah, I mean that's uh, and I I kind of went through the same cycle and and I'm hoping that what happens is by like immersing myself into reading things about how we can find truth, like what is useful. But one of the great things I think about James is he leaves wiggle room for some other ideas to show up, right? Because there's things Mm -hmm. about people that can channel energy in certain ways and change the pH levels of water, or there's people that can heal other people. And there's ideas of people overcoming stage four cancer through homeopathic remedies. And you just start going like, none of this jives with our current truths. So there has to be some sort of and this is where I keep going with this is there has to be a philosophy that has some sort of room in it for the human, because if it gets too systemic or objective, right, then we're back into rationalism where there's this absolute well, there, other I mean, truth. There are, there, there are philosophies that are very human, like phenomenology mm. and, um, uh, existentialism, very, very human. Um, you know, if, if you're, whole philosophy is about like your embodied experience like you can't um uh that's that's a pretty human human philosophy and then i would say like deleuze and guattari um are pretty human Mm -hmm. they i feel like they're like a little unnecessarily obtuse in their language sometimes and i have i feel like the way that they talk about schizophrenia is sort of like romanticizing schizophrenia. And I do like understand that part of like Guattari just, it was very much like about like Foucault, the Foucault like idea that like society is what's mad and not like the, the person is like bad. But um, I think it's like a little more nuanced than that. Cause it, it must be difficult. It, like it, it must be very difficult regardless of what society you, you live in to live um, with a brain that is firing in that way, like constantly. And, um, but there is the way that they talk about it is like, they say schizophrenic thinking or rhizomatic thinking. And so they're talking about like how schizophrenics are capable of sort of like seeing lots of things at once and drawing conclusions and connections where other people can't see the pattern. And what they're saying is that actual line of thinking is how reality actually is. And so, but the way they say it is very confusing and does it like, and I'm like, yeah, it sounds like they are basically saying that someone with schizophrenia is not sick and like doesn't need help. It's sort of like the way that the, the language that they use. So I was just like, I agree with the idea, but I'm like flustered by the language. Yeah, no, it's, it makes sense. It's, I I think that it's one of those things we we bumped into earlier when we're talking about people holding contradictory beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. Is that that in itself can seem schizophrenic, um, yet it's part of sort of a a mapping of multiple networks on top of each other or meshing them. And of course they talk a lot about flows and they talk about all these other kinds of things. And it's sort of, and I haven't gone deep enough down that, um, that rabbit hole like i've read parts of deluce and guitar but i've never really dug in i feel like lots of people have read parts and myself included i have not i'm not fully dug into a thousand plateaus Um, and it's and it's like super thick like it's a big book too and it's just like oh and of of course the complaint i've always heard is that they just got really high (laughs) and just made all this stuff fucking love them so much like the umwelt Mm. and like we are porous umwelten like colliding and intertwining like i fucking love that like it's they're poetic as shit and like them and merlot ponty are both like very poetic um which also means like at times you're like what the fuck are you saying like (laughs) they just got lost in poetry (laughs) yeah yeah it's like okay you're on some shit right now but that's fine (laughs) but speaking of people who were possibly very high like james james apparently was like really into nitrous oxide and i just think of like all the people that were sort of like dismissed 
um, in my upbringing because, like, oh, well, they did drugs. And, and then, like, so many people do drugs. And, and like, also, like, clearly Ezekiel was on some fucking shrooms or something. Like, and I think John licked a toad and then wrote a Revelation. So... <laughs> You know, uh, and what's what's funny about Revelations is it's in the canon, right? Like, and yet it makes such little sense. And uh, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. Well, uh, there's. I think that's one of the things that I I'm, I keep circling around is that that idea that there needs to still be creativity. That there needs to still be these sort of, I don't know, some sort of gateways or pathways we can go down. So yeah, while we can hold on to empirical data and facts and science uh-huh. and all these things, then there's a part of me that wants us to be able to like still be able to sandbox and play with new ideas and, mm-hmm. and sort of show some I creativity. Would that, I would definitely say that pragmatism allows for that because like if you're using it properly, he like very much says that in pragmatism is rooted in like empiricism on some level. Like it's never devoid of empiricism and um so like i i think that james is very much he's very wise Mm. in that he is not afraid to be like we don't know we don't know yet and like he doesn't need certainty to have truth and that i think is very important because I think that if you have to have certainty in order to have truth, when you become certain, so to speak, that things aren't working for everybody, if you become, I don't know, what's that term? Woke or whatever. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> like, if you woke up, <laughs> but you're struggling, you like, it, it, you, you're struggling to like wrestle with, like you can wake up, but you don't you don't immediately like oh I have awoken and suddenly like white supremacy like I could just take it off <laughs> no you have to like fucking dig into it and like perform a really gross autopsy mm-hmm. and um you, but I, I like that he's not he you don't need certainty yeah to like recognize something is true or untrue. Yeah, I think previously you brought up that truth was an action, right? Yeah. 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 Truth is, truth is sort of like the true, the true truths of, of uh, any philosophy are what it looks like in reality, how it is acted out, so to speak, the praxis of it the methodology of it in the real world what does it look like in the real world and those are its truths um so that has some very interesting implications doesn't it so yeah what would you say is the truth of uh i i immediately thought of christianity but i (laughs) based um, on that yeah um i have always thought that it's it's based on communality more than mm-hmm. anything else and then i think within that it's just an allegiant belief system so the group believes what the group believes but the idea that it splinters into so many sects tells you that there's not a singular belief system right that it's it's really about group dynamics and you watch split offs and you watch joining and you watch movement within these things. And it comes back to that idea of networking and to just mm-hmm. finding community and these beliefs being part of a community. But I also, I think there's something really interesting about the idea that humans want ill logic. They want things that are not logical because it allows for sort of a myriad of um, open options in the future. Uh And so that's one of the things I think is really interesting about religion and about a lot of other kind of belief systems is that they're because they don't quite line up with logic. Then you're then open to think about other things. Tons of people would very much disagree with you because like most people that believe like very much think that there is a logic is that they've come to their logical. I think there's even a fucking book called logical conclusions that my dad wanted me to read recently um, that I was like, nah, pass. Um, But, uh, (laughs) 
Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the, yeah. I think that's the other side of it is just being okay with being illogical. It is something for me that I'm I'm trying to get grips on that I'm not logical as a creature, and that I make a no, bunch of bad decisions. Yeah, that's true. Well, so I think we are logical creatures. We are actually very logical, but the difficulty is like we are not logical in like the like you take logic philosophy class like logical. We we are all logical like little children logical, hmm. and then. Um, because little kids have like a limited perspective, very limited perspective on, and their whole world, like if you want to get into like attach, like psychology, I mean, you can talk about like attachment theory and, um, the idea of like, okay, like if our consciousness and our like understanding and our brain, like our neural pathways are very like starting to like develop very um in in their groove by the time we're like five years old and um so it becomes like more and more difficult for us to branch out from our like limited world view if we are not exposed to new ways of thinking and um we we can get like really dug into our like uh, preconceived notions that were formed when our brain was like brand new um and there's so many things that can affect that. Like, we know that, like, language can affect the way you think, the kind of language that y- you speak. Um, like, it, the, your culture that you exist in, your ethnicity, I can't say that, ethnicity, um, ethnicity, um, and the, like, your socioeconomic status, like, uh, the health of your your mom can potentially like de- like depending on like the kind of birth experience like like pregnancy like there's so many fucking factors <laughs> that affect uh, affect it but uh, it's very very crucial at an early age and like so much I've been in therapy for a long time and what I'm realizing is like so much of what I'm confronting is actually like a child a child's way of thinking, a child's way of understanding and processing various things that happen. And so I think re- remembering that we all have this sort of like inner child that we have to like talk to and be like, yeah. okay, so yeah, I know you thought that things were this way, but I've, I've talked to a therapist before who brought up a lot that that, that inner child, the things that the decisions and the strategies that you develop as a child, they might save you at the time, but those become your dysfunctions when you become an adult. So, But the problem you're talking about is routing, the, getting locked into these channels, these sort of routed behaviors. And this, mm-hmm. for you, becomes your behaviors, your actions, your common sense, your survival strategies. And yet when you get older, maybe you don't need them anymore, but we're still in the behavior set of using them. And and I think that's, uh, yeah, that's when James talks about the difficulty of getting rid of common sense or breaking these views down or taking in new truths, then I find that it's very difficult to do that. And you do have to do a lot of work. And even if you mm-hmm. have all the facts put in front of you, then we seem to be really good at rationalizing out a reason why it doesn't apply. Because yeah. once again, if we're logical creatures, there's always another set of logics for why we get to do what we want to do anyway, right? Because that's actually just takes off the cognitive dissonance. It's easier not to change. And our, the internal logic of the thing, like Mm -hmm. is really hard to overcome for sure. Yeah. Oh my God. But the other thing he says about truth that I think is really important is that truth is a process. Like the, the, it's that, that unlearning, like it's dynamic. It's not fixed. It's Mm -hmm. like, I think, I think that like we know more things now than what he did know, so I think we can sort of have some declarative statements, um, as long as you sort of like couch it in like, well, it seems to me, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it, but it it does it does seem to me that we sort of we understand that truth is dynamic and not something that is like fixed in the static way. Um, that truth is a process and 
that you don't have to have certainty in order for truth. And I love those three things. I think those mm-hmm. are, that's very, and it's very helpful. It's a very helpful way of approaching truth because as difficult as it is to process it, I think that it allow it gives you space for that process. So, Yeah, I, I like that a lot. I think that's, I mean, that's, I think that's what we're going for is, is finding some space and time being forgiving of ourselves, but also sort of realizing that that, that truth lies there. And, you know, and early you started out with the, the book on empathy. And I think uh-huh. that's what led both of us to James as well. Like this idea that we wanted somebody who could simultaneously look at facts, but still be empathetic. Mm-hmm. And he strikes me as yeah. somebody who's doing that in a really smart, interesting way, like threading the needle between all these different philosophies and ideas and sort of showing that it's possible to not only be intelligent, but all, you know, and pay attention to a lot of things, but also to be open to being wrong, to being fallible. Yeah. I mean, like he, 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 there was some mention here. Oh yeah. In the, what pragmatism means lecture, which I think is the second lecture. Um, he talks about like, he's, he goes off on like, the um if you can have his name the formula of the incantation that binds him you can control the spirit genie afright or whatever power may be solomon knew the names of all the spirits and i was like what and like looked up that and that's from a like a apocryphal book mm. the idea is the, like the key of solomon or something i don't remember what it was called but um and so i was and it was like affiliated with the occult so i kind of like like he apparently believed in mediums and stuff. And like, so he, he is like a way more open-minded person than I initially thought when, um, when I started this, especially since he references, um, the Bible all the time. All the time. Yeah. I think it's, well, it's just part of the culture back then, yeah. you know? Yeah. It and, still is in yeah. many ways, mm-hmm. way more than we realize. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm trying to like, yeah, I'm trying to also keep my mind open on all those things. I am started a new audio book called American Cosmic, and I'll pass it on Ooh. to you, but it's really... What is that? It's, uh, it's dealing a lot with ufology and um, individuals... Ufology? Like UFOs? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay. you know, it's dealing with UFOs and the idea that people are, can be remote viewers and have these certain conditions, but this being sort of a religion that was a religion of belief that was developed in the United States primarily. And are you talking about Heaven's Gate? I don't know if it's going to get into that, but it does get into CIA black ops programs and stuff like that. Oh. So that, that just okay. ties so much into the Roswell upbringing that I, I had to, Ooh. had to dig in. Yeah, you totally, <laughs> for sure. Uh, yeah. I'm excited to learn more about the CIA also. And, and like a uh, heavy-hearted sort of way, but yeah, um, just getting ready to be real angry all the time. <laughs> well, that's one of the things I've been thinking about is that the podcast lately feels like I've just been going on like a three-month rant. <laughs> and I was just like, I need to finally like turn a corner and go towards something that is... Um, positive and building read, and potential. Read Re- Rutger Bregman's Humankind and uh, Utopia for Realists. Humankind, especially, because so his whole premise is that um, uh, like we have adopted historically in the Western world, we've adopted a, a Hobbesian sort of view and mm-hmm. veneer theory, and he's saying that like uh, actually we, like Rousseau and his idea that like actually we create systems of inequity and therefore we could change them um uh and it's what leads to people's bad behavior um and sort of like gives evidence of of uh rousseau being right over the course of like a 400 page book roughly but it's written really well um it's very exciting like there's a real life story of um uh, Lord of the Flies, and so it's, sort of, it's got like an adventure story in the middle of it. There's some science stuff, some biology, um, some uh, bystander effect, a whole lot of like 
fucked up shit happened because of Milgram and mm-hmm. the Stanford experiment. I mean, oh my god, like, can we please, like, have him just, the only time he should ever be photographed, Milgram should be always in a dunce cap, like, <laughs> always in a dunce cap, be like, this asshole, he's an asshole, he fucked up so much shit in, like, the later 20th century and today, like, Part of the reason why we have the prison industrial complex existing in the way that it does is because of Milgram and like. Yeah, yeah. well, and he I wasn't allowed to do that. certain experiments in certain areas, and when he did do them, they were off the books, and it's just like the whole thing is questionable. But and then he didn't do them right. Yeah, pro- yeah. Like there's so, oh, like I I think psychology should constantly be working towards a better relationship with with neurobiology and understanding neurobiology because neurobiology you can do ethical testing with i have a really hard time with a lot of the like psychology experiments that that exist because they just they never account for all of the variables and it's nearly impossible to actually do so um and it just, oh, God, so many of them terrible, never have, are not like replicate, re, replicate, yes, rep, replicable, that word. replicatable, replicated, re, able to be replicated. There we go. <laughs> On that. There's a word for yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So on that, do you think we're, uh, we're brain fried and we need to end this? I, I, I'm i tongue-tied, for sure. Um, <laughs> well, I think we have four minutes left, so we why, do don't we, uh, minutes left. why don't we sign off? Are we signing off? Okay. Let's... I really enjoyed this. I was so nervous. I was really nervous. Oh, I, I was you, like... yeah, you started off a little nervous, but you, you got into <laughs> it and kicked butt. Good job. Well, thank you. I hope it made sense. I don't know, like... Well, we'll see with the three uh, people I have following me listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I... thank you for listening if you want details or some reference links I will try to get them located on the website page for this episode as always thanks so much for your time and stay safe